Good morning. Good morning. You know what? Would, would this offend anybody if I take my... I want to preach unencumbered today. Um, <laughs> reminds me of a church that we had formerly attended before Church of the Rock got started. Uh, a fr- good friend of mine and his wife that went to that church invited his parents to the church uh, first time. And they were pretty much mainline denominational people. And so the service was over, and he asked his mom, what did you think of the service? And she goes, well, it was okay, but the pastor didn't wear a robe. (laughs) So um, aren't you glad that you're free from all of that? I mean, seriously. It would have been a better sermon had he had a robe on, I guess. The title of today's sermon is, Are You Anchored? And it's a personal question. Uh, one that I hope will be answered by the time that I'm finished. The text of this is Hebrews 6.19. And it says this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Now, there's a number of things that jump out at me uh, when I read this scripture. Actually, five things. And here they are. We hope, anchor, Soul, firm, and secure. Now, let's take them one at a time. The first one is we. Now, who's the we that this verse is referring to? We have this hope. Well, if you read the preceding six verses before this, it's quite specific. Uh, I'd read it, but then you wouldn't read it, and I don't want to be the cause for your spiritual laziness. So, your homework tonight is to read Hebrews 6, 13 to 18. But until then, you're going to have to take my word for it. The we refers to the heirs of God. Now, these are special people who will inherit the treasures of God's kingdom. I'm talking about the exceptionally religious ones of God and righteous ones of God, the Lord's holiest, like non-denominational pastors. Well, non-denominational pastors can certainly be included in this we, but so can housewives and nurses and businessmen and students and teachers and lawyers and wit... Well, lawyers, not so much maybe, but... (laughs) Sorry, counselor. (laughs) Widows and the young and those not so young. Now, your job title or your description obviously doesn't really matter or doesn't really count, even whether it's in the church or it's out of the church, that doesn't make you an inheritor of God's treasures. There's only one thing, and one thing only, that will allow you to inherit the kingdom, and that is this. You must be a child of the king. It's the only thing. John 1, 12. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right, say right, He gave the right to become children of God. First of all, becoming a child of God is a God-given right. He gave the right. Right in the Greek, exousia, and it means privilege. That privilege that John writes about is granted to everyone who has believed in and received Jesus Christ as Lord. The moment you believe, you become a child of God. Look at Galatians 3.26. So in Christ Jesus... You are all children of God through what? Through faith, right? Faith in the Greek, pistis. And it's used in this context as a, of a strong conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, that pretty much narrows it down as to the, who the children of God are. I'm sorry to burst the worldly bubble that says every human being is a child of God because we just read scripture that tells us, no, everyone is not a child of God. The Bible is very specific of that. All people are God's creation, but not all people are his children. To legitimately refer to God as father can only come from one of his children. Now, to be a child of God, there has to be a strong conviction that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the Lord. Here's one more distinguishing characteristic to show that God is your father. Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 
One must have faith and believe in Jesus Christ, believe that he is the Messiah, the one and only Son of God, and then accept, you must accept his gift of grace for the eternal healing of your soul. And then you must be led by his Holy Spirit. And if that is you, then the Bible confirms that you are a child of God. Now, let's take a moment, because this is personal. As I said, this is personal. Can I have all the children of God acknowledge somehow that you are his child? Now, had I asked for everybody that's a Steelers fan to somehow let us know that. Okay. Amen. I'm a child of the king. We I want you to see and understand just the privilege that it is to be his child. See, I want to make that clear. You know, I, I love coming here and, and for, for a number of reasons. You know, and I, I know there's so many things to do in the summertime, but I love to golf and I love to do all those things. But I love coming here because it reminds me of things that I need a reminding of. And one of the things we need reminded of all the time is that we are a child of the living God. His children. So now, let's see what the privilege of being a child of God does for us. Romans 8, 15 to 17 says this, Paul writes, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, if we are his children, and we know how we are his children, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know, in reality, we just had the reading of the will. And in this reading of the will, the Father has willed us, uh, let's see, everything. He has given us everything. Wow. Once you become a child of God, then you become an heir. An heir to everything that God has because we are co-heirs with Christ. You know, back in... In Old Testament times, the eldest son got two-thirds of, of, of everything, right? And then the rest was divvied up. No, that's not us. We are co-heirs with Christ. We get, we get it all. Now, if that knowledge doesn't excite you or doesn't encourage you or give you reason to stand and shout this morning, you might want to go back and, and, and look at the qualifications once again of becoming a child of God, just to see if there's something there that you missed. Because this is pretty exciting stuff. And I don't care if you're 14 or you're 94. This is pretty exciting. Now, the second word that jumps out from Hebrews 619 is hope. It says, for we, the children of God, have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. Well, that inheritance that Roman 8 speaks to that each child of God is destined to receive according to the book of Hebrews, that is what has become our hope. Now, just as I mentioned last week, biblical terminology is often different from our Western English terminology. Well, it might be the same word. It often and it does have a different meaning. Merriam-Webster hope, chance, prospect, possibility. We also define hope even further by crossing our fingers and blowing out candles and making a wish. Hope to us can be thinking happy thoughts and longing for something good to happen. That's our English synopsis of the word hope. That's not biblical hope. When you read the word hope in Scripture, that is not what it is defined as. It's certainly not the hope that the children of God long for. Hope, biblical translation, LPs in the Greek. And it means joyful and confident expectation. You see the difference there? From having a chance to expecting something confidently. All right, let's plug in this hope translation now. Hebrews 6, 19. The children of God have this joyful and confident expectation as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. 
Okay, now, in order to understand what we owe our joy to and to what we can confidently expect, again, we got to go back and see what it is. This hope that we can confidently expect is referring to the oath and the promise that God had made to Abraham. You'll see that when you read tonight's homework. After Abraham had offered his son Isaac to the Lord as a sacrifice, Scripture tells us this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky as the sand on the seashore. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Did you see us in there? Did you see it? We're part of that all nations who are blessed. That's you and I. And every child of God. The angel was not referring to some geographical nation. But this promise of God is to the nation of people who make up God's family. Abraham is not just the father of the Jews, but he is the spiritual father of all who love Jesus. Look at this in Romans. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, God's promise to Abraham, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, who are of the law, the Jews, not only to them who are of the law, but also to those who have faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And what was promised through Abraham is ours to receive. Now, the next word is anchor, but I'm, I'm going to come back to that. We're first going to take a look at the word soul. Soul in the Greek, suhe. And when used of a believer, it means this, moral being designed for everlasting life. As I spoke last week, this is our inner person, separate from the physical person. Remember, the physical person is our shell, this vessel that people see, our fleshly bodies. And they're, des they're designed to return to the dust. But our spiritual bodies, those are eternal beings. And they're designed for everlasting life. Somewhere. Either within the kingdom of God for all of his children or outside the kingdom of God for those who are not his children. All right, let's move along. We have the words now firm and secure. In the Greek, firm, asphalos, and it means certain and true, secure in the Greek, babaios, and it means steadfast and sure. So now we can start putting this together again to see what the translation of Hebrews 6.19 says. The children of God have a joyful and confident expectation that we are the inheritors of God's promise to Abraham. And we have this as an anchor for our certain and sure everlasting life. If you read Scripture and you believe Scripture, you realize that we all will live forever somewhere. Or not fleshly, obviously, but spiritually. This is good stuff. Okay, so the final word from Hebrews 6.19 that I want to talk about is really the crux of today's lesson. And that is an anchor. The anchor. As inheritors of God's kingdom, we have a joyful expectation, joyful expectation of everlasting life, right? Cause for an amen there, isn't it? We have this understanding by way of spiritual and supernatural knowledge. We don't ascertain this on our own. We, we, we receive this from God. Through his Holy Spirit, he tells us and he makes known himself to us. Scripture tells us throughout the New Testament that the Spirit will teach us all things. Jesus said that. So that's how we understand God. That's how we understand Scripture. We don't just read it and intellectually understand it because there's, there's, you know, there's good stuff in there intellectually. But from a, a, a standpoint of our own lives and the good that it does for our lives from a spiritual, eternal standpoint, we've got we to get this from the Spirit of God himself. He's our teacher. He's our counselor. All right, so we have this, this anchor. 
And we have it by way of supernatural knowledge. This understanding, this insight, this realization that we are receiving the eldest son's share of everything that God has to offer. This understanding this of an, our inheritance, this is what anchors us. Anchor. It's important to understand the word anchor as it's translated. It really is. Anchor in the Greek is ankora. And here's what it means. It means anchor. It really opens it up to us, doesn't it? <laughs> Gives you so much more flavor. No, that's, that's really what it means, anchor. And that's what the writer of Hebrews really is talking about, an anchor, something that we can see. So let's talk about the anchor. Anchors have been around for centuries. They've been around for a long time. And, you know, in the beginning, anchors were basically just a bunch of rocks tied together. And then about 3,000 years ago, they began to evolve into kind of what we have today, this, this anchor. And, you know, anchors obviously are used on boats. Anchors are used on ships. That's what they are. And, and, and they're used for what we, we think they're used for, so that the boat or the ship doesn't move once the anchor is put down, right? Because boats and ships move, um, if, even if they're not in power, under power, under sail, they still move. They move with the current, or they'll move with the tide, or they'll move with the wind. That's what they can do. So when ship captains don't want the boat to move, then they'll drop anchor. And when they drop anchor, and when it's secured to the bottom by these teeth right here, when they're secured to the bottom, the ship won't move. And that's, that's pretty important for the ship not to move. Now listen, I... I don't want to give you this in-depth understanding or this nautical terminology about anchors because really the author of Hebrews is using the anchor pretty much as a symbol or a metaphor for God. And that's, that's what I want to talk about. Once we allow our lives to embed themselves as this anchor embeds itself into the bottom of of whatever it is, the ocean or a lake, whenever we allow ourselves to sink into God and His Holy Word, then we are firm. And we are spiritually secure. We're steadfast. Just like the ship is when it's anchored. Once anchored, now spiritually speaking, nothing will move us against our will. Not currents, not the wind, not even storms when they come in our lives. Now the analogy is our, our anchor is tethered to the Lord, not by human means, but by divine means, which tells us one thing. Once anchored to God, we never get released. See, the knot that is tied to our anchor, that one has been bound by God. So here's what we have. Joshua. God said, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And just as a ship is safe and stable once anchored, anchored and it cannot be blown off course, neither can we who have anchored ourselves to the Lord. So we have God's word that he'll never let go of us once we're tethered to him. Never leaving us, never forsaking us. We can always rely on God to be our anchor once we anchor our lives to him. But we have to remember that the rope holding the anchor has two ends to it, right? One is attached supernaturally by the Lord. The other end of the rope is tethered to us and being held by natural man. If the rope loosens from the ship's ring bolt, the anchor stays in place. But now with more play in the rope, the ship begins to move further and further away from the anchor. The further the ship moves away from the anchor, the less secure it becomes. Strong winds or a storm can really rock it back and forth much easier. The longer the rope is, the more torque is put on it, causing those in the ship to be tossed about. The tighter the rope is tethered to the anchor, the more secure it is, and the less chance that there is for anyone to be tossed around or even more important, pitched into the ocean where they then are 
perilously alone up to their neck in water. If the rope that is tethered to the anchor begins to loosen, then the ship begins moving whichever way the current or the wind takes it. A loose rope places the ship at the mercy of the forces of nature. When we loosen our anchor to the Lord, which we can do, we have access to doing that 24-7. He stays exactly where he was at when we became bound to him. But we, as we move further and further from him, we begin placing our lives at the mercy of nature. Or more accurately, we, we place our lives at the mercy of the flesh. And let me tell you something, there's not much mercy coming from the flesh. For the children of God, that, that current that is constantly moving is the world. And Paul warns us this, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world. The moment we begin moving with the current, moving as the world moves, the more we'll discover that our flesh approves of this. Come on. And the more our flesh will encourage us, actually our flesh will urge us to loosen our grip on the anchor even more. Come on, just let out a little bit more of the rope. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there now. I, I don't know. But at the onset of your thinking, you were saying things like, or what was going through your head, was, what harm could there come from a little loosening? Until one day you wake up to find that you have drifted so far from your anchor that you're not sure how or even if you can get back. And listen, once the rope gets loosened from the anchor and we start drifting with the current of the world, getting back to where our anchor is secured is no easy task. And if we set sail to get back there, we quickly realize we got some problems. Because now we got to move against the current. As I said, the current of the world, brothers and sisters, it's as easy as anything to move with that current. It's easy to, to, to get caught up in the world and do as the world does, live as the world lives. It's so easy to do. We don't need any help with that. Anybody can do it. And you do it by first, quit being intentional about holding fast to your anchor, which is the Lord, and then just let the natural order of things take over. Start abandoning your Bible study. Start abandoning your, 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 your meeting together, as some people tell us that we need to be doing. Forget about doing all of that, and all this other stuff, moving with the current, will just naturally happen. It's really uncanny. To go against the current, however... It's going to prove to be one of the most difficult things we can ever do. Going against the current, well, first of all, that'll exhaust us. Because the world is coming at us as we're trying to make our way back to our anchor. We'll get weary. It's going to play tricks with our faith. It will encourage us time and time again. You know what? Just, just give up. And listen. Listen. Most people, once drifted away from the anchor, they're going to need help getting back. As easy as it was drifting all by ourselves away from the anchor with the current, it will prove to be a hundred times more difficult to shorten the rope and fight our way back to the anchor. However, what we have to remember is this, just who it is on the other end of our rope. Psalm 118.7, the Lord is with me, he is my helper. Well, it will prove to be a very difficult thing returning this vessel to the anchor. It is certainly not impossible because Jesus tells us this. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Anyone who has loosened their grip to the anchor and drifted with the current for a while knows just how challenging it really is returning to the anchor. And one of the most challenging issues we find when we're trying to do that, fighting against the current, is hearing the current of the world 
tell us things like, you know what? The anchor doesn't even want you back. But we know the word of God, don't we? And we know that that's a lie. And we can relate this to the parable of the prodigal. Seems to pop up here every week. When the son of the prodigal in that story saw just how far he had drifted from his father, he came to his senses and he decided, you know what, I'm going to go back. Don't think that was easy. Don't think it was simple, him just, just taking off and going back to, the, to his father. Because he had to fight his way through things like pride. And let me tell you something, pride is responsible for more people walking away or not returning to God, I think, than anything else. I believe there's demons of pride, and they, they got to have the, the sharpest and the longest talons of, of any demon, I think. They just sink in, and, and pride won't let you do a whole lot of things. So he had to fight his way through pride. He had to fight his way through shame. He had to fight through fear of the unknown. He didn't know what his father was going to say. I mean, his father could have kicked him out. He could have refused to see him. He could have even disowned him. Get away from me. You're no longer my son. He had no idea that his father not only wanted him back, but that his father was waiting and watching with open arms for him to return. And when his father saw him from a distance, he ran out and embraced him. That's our Lord. Symbolized by the father and the prodigal, and obviously symbolized by the anchor in today's lesson. When we stay tightly bound to our anchor, the Lord, the current doesn't affect us. We hardly move at all. Oh, we might sway a little bit back and forth from time to time, but, but this firm grip that we have keeps us centered over the anchor, and we are assured of safety and well-being. You know, when we are tightly bound to our anchor, fear has a way of keeping its distance. Can I get an amen on that? When you're in the Word, when you're studying, when you're fellowshipping with other believers, fear doesn't seem like it's so important. When we stay tightly bound to our anchor, the current of the world gets exposed and shown, really, for the perverse and wicked influence that it is. You know, when you're, when you're in sin, you don't really recognize how bad it is. It's only when you return to the anchor, when you start aligning everything else with Jesus and the Word of God, you now see it for how perverse. And you, you think to yourself, how in the world could I have ever been there? Seriously, how could I have? I'm a child of God. I'm anchored. I'm anchored to the Lord. We need to stay tightly bound for many reasons. Paul writes this. <laughs> In Ephesians 4, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. You know, another reason we need to be bound to our anchor is that when, when we hear a message that is not scriptural, we will understand that it's not scriptural. Something's off. When we stay aligned and, and, and held fast and tethered tight to the Lord, we, these things we, we can discern. That's why we need to be there. And look, when the worldly current comes calling, and we know, that the worldly current comes calling. Or when the world's wind seems to be exceptionally strong in our lives, when it feels as though our own flesh, our own flesh is causing us or influencing us to loosen our grip just a little. That's when we need to even grab hold tighter. That's when we have to shut out all the noise that the world is screaming and that the flesh is making, and we got to stay the course. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. You know, ships that find themselves unable to make headway against the wind or the current, fearing that they might be maybe dashed against the rocks because they, they, they can't make headway, They'll actually begin to throw everything overboard. 
anything that might weigh them down and keep them from staying the course and reaching their destination. That's the call here in Hebrews, in the Scripture. Sin so easily entangles, doesn't it? You don't even have to go looking for it. Sin so easily weighs us down that once we engage in it, once we loosen our hold on the anchor, we find it almost impossible to reverse, reverse our course and go back. When that happens, you wake up and you see that anchor so far in the distance. What we have to do, we have to begin to unload anything and everything that prevents us from heading due course to the anchor. And you know what? It's not just blatant sin that encourages us to loosen our grip on the anchor. Just living in this sin-filled, broken, and diseased world. This world that constantly opposes God and his children. That easily does it. So often we can find ourselves at the end of our rope trying to hold on for dear life because we hear voices tell us things like this. Just let go. It's not worth it. Probably no anchor on the end anyway. If God really loved you, he would have not allowed you to have that sickness. Your children wouldn't be so lost if God would have done his part. God could have saved your marriage if he wanted to. How many times have you prayed to God and he never answered you? Why do you even waste your time believing, going to church, praying to God? Listen, when those voices begin to appear, throw all that stuff overboard and hold fast to the promises that God has made to his children. We are a child of God. Now, before I close, some of you may not be aware of another time a, a ship's captain drops anchor. He drops anchor when he's heading into port. Before he gets to the dock, the captain realizes that there's someone more skilled, someone more able than he is to bring the vessel in. That someone is the harbor pilot. Most harbors have a pilot who waits on shore until a vessel approaches with a desire to dock. And when summoned, the harbor pilot will leave the shore, travel out to the anchored ship, and with the captain's permission, he'll take over the command of the ship. You see, the harbor pilot is very familiar with the harbor. He's an expert on things like depth of the water and the direction and the strength of the wind or the daily and hourly current and tide schedule. The harbor pilot then navigates this vessel through the channels that he knows so well until it arrives safely and is securely docked. The harbor pilot doesn't bully his way on board. He doesn't show up where he's not welcome. The harbor pilot, who is far more skilled than the captain of the ship, simply offers his help where and when needed. What a beautiful picture that is of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. Maybe you had anchored yourself one time to the Lord. Committed your life to Him. But the currents and the winds of this world have influenced you to kind of let up on your once stronghold. Maybe you got blown off course. Not sure where or even if you can get back. Well, here's a suggestion. Call out to the harbor pilot. Summon him. Invite him. Give him permission to come on board and to bring you back. It won't be easy. Because there are going to be things that you're going to have to fight through. You're going to have to fight through pride. You're going to have to fight through shame. You have to fight through remorse. And you're going to have to fight through the ever flowing, tugging current. <laughs> Hebrews 3, 6. Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we boast.
You know, the day that we made Christ our Lord and Savior or received his gift of grace, those of you that have, you remember that day or that time or what was going on in your life. If you're like me, the moment that happened, I could not have wrapped myself any more tightly in the Lord and just, there he is. There he is, and I'm not moving. I found something I'm never going to let go. And that's all of us right there at, at our salvation moment when we realized who he is and why we needed him. But you know what? That, for me, that was a long time ago. You know, I've got to live life. So, you know, currents, the world. You know, I'm not, I'm not so inclined to be right over top. You know, I, what's it going to hurt to loosen a little bit? Right? Just a little bit. I know he's still there. He's my Lord. There he is. But you know what? Continuing to live, once you start flowing with the current, brothers and sisters, it doesn't stop moving. We get swept up so easily in the current of the world, don't we? It's so simple. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is just kind of relax and go with it. And then at one point, because that's all we've done is relax and go with it, we find ourselves here. And let me tell you something. It's a lot harder holding on with this much than it is if we just wrap ourselves in it, right? Let's wrap ourselves in it. And listen, there's times in our lives that things happen. Bad things happen. Jesus told us, in this world, you're going to have trouble. He didn't say, oh, it's going to be great. Just hold on to me and you'll be fine. Well, we're human. We're made of flesh. And our flesh wants to experience so many things that, that our spirit doesn't want. So what we got to do, when sin comes knocking, we got to remember the promises of God that he made to his children. I'm a child of God. In the name of Jesus, get away from me. And sometimes... Sometimes, I, you know, we have a tendency in church, how you doing? Everything's great. You know, so we're imagining they're holding on. It's like, yes, but in reality, they're somewhere over there or somewhere over there. That's where we get to from time to time. So we got to hold on. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. So we got to hang in there. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes, we got to do it. But listen, throughout all the currents, throughout all the tides and all the winds and all the storms, just continue to remember the promises of God to his children, us. Right? That's all we got to do. And bind yourself, tether yourself, whatever it takes. And when you find yourself over there, listen, you find yourself over here and, you're, and, and the current's coming at you because you just went with the current. And you're trying to get back. You know what? Call out to the harbor pilot. Call out to a friend. Call out to anyone that's going to help you get back to your anchor. Because that's where you're going to operate life and freedom is right here. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. How it comes alive to us. How, how we read your word and it means so much to us. And how... Father, how applicable it is for where we're at. And I know, Father, that there's, that, that there's people in here that are far away, people in here that are at the end of the rope. Lord, I pray that you, you just let them know how real you are, how much you love them, how you are their father and you want them back. Let them know that there is no shame in coming back to you. That you're not a God that wags his finger at us and say, you've got to pay the penalty before I accept you back. No, you're there with open arms and you're running out to us. Help us to understand that, Father, in our lives. That we may come back to you at any time. And I pray for people, Lord, that, that, that are thinking of maybe loosening up a little bit their grip. I pray, Father, that you would 
influence them so that they hold on even tighter because that's the lie of the world. What harm could there be in loosening that grip? So, Father, we thank you once again. We ask a blessing upon uh, each, each person here in their lives, Lord God, as we, as we leave today. Watch over them, protect them, and be with them. I pray this all in the precious name of our anchor, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.